Can I have everyone's attention, please? Welcome, welcome back to the new year, to the great first event of the ASSC Academic Staff Steering Committee. So glad that all of you could make it. Um, we have a really packed program today, as you can see from the agenda, so I'm going to get started. But one thing that's not on the agenda, Michelle Fecto would like to make an announcement. Before she does that, I would like the ASSC members this year to please rise. Well, there's Shauna Reavers in the back. She's a member at large. Don Niedermiller is our secretary. Sarah Doyle is our co-chair. I'm chair. Uh, Marianne, oh, uh, now, we have the, the best union, as you all know. They, they, they help us get all these things done every semester. And one of the strongest people in our union, in my opinion, were two of them, Mark Dilley and Tammy Force. Mm -hmm. yeah, they are. <laughs> of course, Charlie Parrish, what will we do without President Parrish to lead us and get us going all these years? And, uh, and last but not least, Michelle Fecto, Executive Director of the AEP AFT, our local 6075. And she just wants to speak a few minutes. And that's it. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, Welcome. Hello. 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 So, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I just had a quick announcement. I got a, an email and a phone call from uh, Gracie Zwang. She's from the Ruth Ellis Educational center. Uh, it's, um, they have a group home for LGBT youth over just north of West Grand Boulevard on Woodward. And they are desperately in need of people to help tutor and uh, mentor. They have eight uh, young people that are living in, the, in that group home. It's one of the few in the country that um, just works with LGBT. Um, and they have some special needs, as you can imagine, um, with homelessness and all kinds of issues. But they're trying to get them to focus and finish and um, you know graduate high school and hopefully go on to college. So um, I'm going to give you a blurb that she has here. If uh, you or if you know anyone, if you have organizations or your professional associations <coughs> would like to help them, they are desperate in need. So I just thought it was a really great organization. I know they did really good work, and they're right around the corner from us. So uh, that's my announcement. All right. And, and it's a great way to get community some. service. Yes, and you can, you know, you go as Wayne State uh, Advisors, and you can put that as community mm -hmm. service on your professional record. And you'll also go to heaven, too. <laughs> 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 you can take those, and pass those down. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Thank you Michelle. Um, before we get started on the presentation for Selective Salary, we wanted to give a brief overview of the process and thus the distinction between annual review, selective salary, promotion, and employment and security status. Can you hear me? Okay, I'll be a little bit louder. <laughs> there is so, a microphone. There's a little short. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Not really. No. Not really. <laughs> they need it. All right, I'll try to be a little bit louder. So I just wanted to make the distinction between annual review, selective salary, promotion, and Employment Security Status, ESS. So how many folks are on ESS track? And how many folks have attained their ESS? So we've got a nice mixture in here today. Um, what I wanted to reference today is that the libraries has created a nice outline for their annual review and selective salary process. So is Monique out there? She can wave. <laughs> Just give a shout out to libraries. Um, I thought it was a really <laughs> nice uh, outline. Um, that highlights uh, the differences. While every department might be slightly different, um, it does provide you a really nice example. So here's your annual review. If you're a recently hired academic staff uh, member on term contract, you're going to be going through this process. All right. So everybody that's still on a term contract um, every year will be going through an annual review. Um, you will do this. Uh, you will present your, your uh, dossier, uh, which will be reviewed by the department's ESS promotion and tenure committee. Um, although some, you know, some departments might be a bit smaller, and so there might not be a committee. You might be working directly with your um, director um, in regards to your, your annual review. There's also the selective salary process. So that's, in, a sense, uh, in essence, everybody. All right. Um, the, under the current AAUP contract, each year the president through the deans and directors makes funds available to eligible members of the bargaining unit. 
The funds referred to as selective salary are distributed by the dean in consultation with the duly selected salary committee. The funds are allocated based on a formula defined in the contract. Decisions about selective salary distrib uh, distributions are based upon performance criteria defined in the unit's factors. So you'll really want to know what your factors are for your unit. Um, so how does selective salary and annual uh, review work? So putting it together, um, once you've obtained ESS, you are no longer to complete the annual review. However, you will continue to complete selective, serve, uh, se sorry, a selective salary. So everybody in this room will be, uh, in a sense, um, completing this process. So you know, keep a lookout for ASSC future events and workshops will help you with the professional work, uh, record, promotion, and ESS. Um, but for the purposes of today's topic, selective salary, I'd like to uh, now introduce <coughs> Kim Morgan. Kim Morgan is the math department advisor and chair of the class <coughs> academic staff committee, which oversees <coughs> elections for the selective salary and ESS promotion committees. She is also the chair of the selective salary organizational subcommittee of the ASSC, which has been working on resources and information for those preparing selective salary packets in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So you can help me welcome Kim to the podium. <laughs> Everyone. Um, can you hear me in the back? I, I do really have the teacher voice. I know some people say they, they have it and they really don't, but I do have it, I think. Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have within the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences an academic staff collegial committee, which was just recently resurrected last summer. I'm the chair of that. And Kim Hunter is the vice chair, and Jill DeJesus is the secretary. Now, as part of that committee, our responsibilities encompass uh, elections for the ESS and promotion committee, as well as selective salary. So we decided that it would be very helpful if we created a committee to bring together the resources that are available for our class staff into one location. So we created our uh, Selective Salary Organizational Subcommittee, which we finally call SOS, and uh, uh, started working on that. If you were on that committee, would you please stand up so you can be recognized for the work that you did on that? I'd appreciate it. We've got five, I think four or five people who were on it. What we did was we made a Blackboard site, which is going to be made available to our, our class advisors and ASOs and so forth in the next day or so. Uh, Within that, we put together a lot of the different things, whether that be links to different uh, resources or if it was actual documents. So what I'd like to do is go through this Blackboard site, and what we're hoping that you will do is within your division or unit, make something <laughs> similar in some way, like the libraries did. By the way, I want to talk to you about that library site. It looks wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> all right. So we... Presently, we've only done for selective salary. We plan to increase this for ESS and promotion. But the main thing that we uh, wanted to start with was the disclaimer. Keep in mind that much of this information is supplemental <laughs> to what your immediate superior outlines for your process. If your superior wants the process done in a particular way that is not contrary to the provost office instructions, then follow that procedure. Content found here other than direct links to forms and procedures from the provost's office is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as official, official procedure. All right? <coughs> so then we put together a number of helpful things. The first thing that we did, we wanted to link to the important documents that were uh, given in the provost's office and so forth and AAUP rather than actually putting those documents on our site. That way, if any changes occurred, it would stay current, okay? So the first thing we did was we did a link to the professional record template, okay? And 
one of the things that we're stressing throughout this is to stick to the template. Okay? Ryan is also going to be presenting in a couple minutes about what that professional record can look like and some examples. He's handing out some examples right now. We're not handing them out to class people because you're going to have access to this Blackboard site, but for those that don't, will not have access, we are handing out copies of that. Okay? So now, the next link is to the memos and guidelines, which you may or may not have received for this year. So this is again on the Office of the Provost. Okay? At the bottom we have two different documents. The first one is the memo that uh, Provost Vanderweg sends out, and that has the general guidelines. And then uh, there's also <coughs> the actual guidelines. Uh, document. I want to look at this one. This document, along with your unit's factors put together, is how your committee or group will determine whether or not you get selective salary. So they go together. Each unit has its own factors. So you need to make sure that you're referring to them when you put your packets together. And the last packet, or the last link, <coughs> is to the AAUP um, AFT uh, contract. Starting on page 18 is where compensation starts, and I believe it's on page 27 where it talks about selective salary specifically. Okay. The next thing that we did, oh, sorry, I went to the wrong thing. That's actually for later. My apologies. Okay. Uh, well, Ryan will be talking about the three-year summaries and the current activities during his part. The next thing that we did, we thought it would be helpful for our academic staff to have guides. Not necessarily a full mentor, just a guide when they have a question. So what we've made, what we've made available is a list of those within our unit who would be willing to answer any questions and if someone's interested in that they can contact our list holders and then they'll let them know who's available who could help them to uh, just for quick questions and so forth regarding it. Okay. So now I'm going to turn things over to Ryan. Ryan is the advisor for political science, public affairs, and law start and he's been part of our committee as well. So as Kim mentioned, um, we do have those guides for people who would like someone to talk to about uh, for their selective salary process, but we also know a lot of people have been doing this for a while, they don't necessarily need a guide uh, as a person to help them, but they might need other things to look at as to uh, what they should be doing on this. And we want to have a little bit more of a standardized way for people to make their selective salary packets because uh, everyone who is on the committee, we've all been a part of our selective salary committee for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and every time we go through it, people have different formats, different things they put in different areas, and so we want to have a little bit more standardization and give people a little bit more direction, especially since we had this advisor initiative where we brought in a lot of new advisors, and they've been told different things depending on their departments, different people they've talked to, so we want to try and get everybody on the same page going forward with that. So in order to do that, we created a couple different documents that people could look at to try and give them some ideas and some direction on how to make their selective salary packets. One of the first things we did was to create um, this instructional template. And in the in instructional template, we focused on giving very general information about how to fill out each section. So we had the blank template, and then we went through, and for each part, we said, all right, here's a tip for filling out that section in case people weren't sure what was expected to be there. So if, if you go through each of it, and this is in your packets, I believe, um, it'll say, you know, for example, description of present position responsibilities. And then it'll have a tip for that, and so on. So it gives people an idea of, of what should be in there and how they should fill out that area. Now, tips are good, but some people still need to see an actual example to understand what should be in there. So people uh, can also look at the uh, Jane Doe, oops, wrong one. 
Um, so we created a second document that is an example. Now this isn't one of our actual advisors. We went through and we tried to create something that would be um, accessible to people. We also understand that not everyone in our um, in class especially is an academic advisor, so we try to make it something that the staff could use. Um, we also have people that work in like the labs. So we try to make it something that everyone can use to get an example of what's going on exactly. Um, now this was an academic advisor that we had in here, but we had them fill out each section. So advisors, staff could then look at the template that had the examples and the tips on it, and then also compare it to uh, it, one that's filled out as if it was an actual person turning this in. So they can compare between the two of them and whatever you know, helps them best understand what should be on that document going forward. So we go through each section and fill it out and give examples of how it should look and what should be in each one of those different sections. Now we also had some problems in that people weren't sure how to format it, uh, when they should start working on this, uh, what should be included in different sections, and even though we have the blank document that has tips on it, even though we have the Jane Doe example, it still doesn't cover everything. So we also created a tips worksheet that goes over um, how to format, some various tips on how to format, on what should be included in the professional record, and then also how you should go about completing your professional record. And we feel like this really gives people uh, a full view of how they should complete the selective salary process. It also creates some standardization within that because if everyone's following the format from the blank document, the example, and then the tips we have here, we should see some very similar um, selective salary packets from here on out. So they can use all these different resources together to create something um, that we think will, will lead to a better selective salary process for all. And this is something, like I said, that isn't just for academic advisors. This is something we create in a very general manner to cover all of our staff not just academic advisors within class. We also understand that um, this might be different depending on what college or school you're in. So that's why we're just encouraging people not necessarily to use exactly what we use, but come up with a committee on your own and do some similar things for the tips and examples for your own uh, school or, or college. We also have on here, um, in case uh, some of our staff are looking for more opportunities to get involved in service, or professional development opportunities, a list of professional um, associations that people can be a part of. And once again, this isn't just uh, for academic advisors, this is for staff, this is for advisors. We even have some on here for athletics, we have some on here for career planning, um, library as well. So this is something that could actually be used uh, for, for anyone else who's looking to, to create a document like this uh, for their own school or college. Because we have quite a bit involved with this uh, our community did a great job of coming up with a lot of different associations that people could be a part of. The last thing that I would like to show you was what Kim kind of alluded to earlier, and that was the three-year summary um, and current activities. This is something that I think a lot of our, um, our, our, our staff as we went through the selective salary were confused about what should be included on the selective salary um, how they should mark, especially the past three years. Um, there are a couple different ways you can do that. You can either just have one select a salary thing that, that has all of your information and then highlight those past three years, or you can create two separate documents that have just the past three years and then also a longer document that has kind of everything. Okay? So we wanted to have that, an understanding, a better understanding of what the three year summary was and how you can include that in there. And then also the current activities document. Um, this is something that uh, we wanted people to understand a little bit better. We saw a lot of different formats within how to do the current activities uh, document. So for that, we included that you could do it several different ways. Um, there's a couple different ways. Create a separate document, uh, include it in your professional record, or include it in your three-year summary as well. So, yeah, Kim? Okay. Um, so then those are the, the, the different documents we have on there. We hope that by using these and giving all these different examples, people will like I said, create a little bit more standardized document for our selected salary to look at, and also just give them a better direction so that they feel more comfortable when they create these things, and also give the people the resources that they need in order to, to feel good about the, the packets they turn in. So I think that's the end of everything I had to present. Kim, you'd like to say something else? Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, 
one thing I wanted to mention, going back, I really want to emphasize this. We put our academic staff factors as a separate document from the Selective Salary Information and Resources because that's also used for ESS and promotion. You need to always be referring to this when you are creating your packets and making sure that the things that you are doing are completing. Uh oh, I guess I gotta <laughs> fix that. All right, um, all right, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, but it looked cute, didn't it? <laughs> Uh, but always be referring to that as you're going to make sure that you are meeting the goals that they are expecting you to meet. All right. The next thing I wanted to mention is within the packet that we gave you, there are also two actual professional records uh, there. One from the biology department and one I, is actually mine, although it's a truncated version. I only did this year's uh, activities for a number of things. So that can give you some ideas. One of the things you're going to notice is the formatting is different. And that's okay. Uh, what we did was we ta actually sat down with our dean who is over this process and we said, what do you want to see in these packets? And made sure that we were following things that they said they wanted us to do, such as emphasized over and over again, follow the template, follow the template. Okay, so one of the things that some of us had been doing was if a particular section didn't apply, we just delete that section. But our superior wanted us to actually just put NA in those sections, okay, so that the template would still be in the packet. Uh, so keeping those kinds of things in mind as you're go going forward, making sure that you are talking with your superiors because they don't necessarily, especially if you're in a department where there's only one or two of you, your superiors are not necessarily going to think to sit down with you and talk about how they want this all to look. So you need to be proactive in that, making sure that you're doing what they need you to do, as well as following the things that we've been talking about here. All right? And just a, another addition mm -hmm. to that. Uh, one of the first things we asked them was, is there any way that we could change uh, or adapt the, the, uh, the, te the template at all? If there was any movement towards that, and it was just flat out no. So, uh, one thing, when you're going through this process, to try and work through the template that you have already, don't even worry about trying to create a new one, because we're, our understanding from the university is that that's not changing. Uh, it was, I think, originally kind of made more for instructors and then adapted to academic staff, but you just have to then, like I said, work within that and understand there are some areas you're not going to use and just put the, the NA in there and that's all. Don't worry too much about trying to fill that in. Just understand what your role is and, and what's expected of you from your own standpoint. And presently, the, the uh, samples that we have here are mostly for AAASO, but uh, uh, for the, the mainstream, the majority of our staff members. But we have people like, and I'm sure you won't mind me saying it, Emil, who does a com very, very different job than most of our um, academic advisors and so forth. So what we're hoping is that we'll be able to put a Jane Doe of that particular job type and so forth so that we can make this a more robust system. Okay. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you can see that's a lot of work. So we're going to make a, a lot of the links and uh, attachments and things like that. We'll send in a follow-up email. So if some folks are curious about links and uh, additional information, you will get that uh, via email. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Lee Robinson. Lee Robinson is the Director of Academic Support for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion in the School of Medicine. She works with pipeline and retention programs across campus. Promoted to an ASO3 in 2013, she receives ESS in 2016 and is the recipient of the ASPDC Outstanding Contributor and Distinguished Service Awards. You'll help me welcome Lee Robinson. Lea. 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 Oh, we can do better than that. Good afternoon, class. So um, I put this presentation together because every year you might be like me. Um, I say, oh, crap, where's all my stuff? Right? And so I put this together because I need a better organized way to um, find um, artifacts of what I've done over the year. And so I decided, well, if I'm using email, I'm using Outlook, there's just stuff there that I should just start using much more deliberately in a much more organized fashion to be successful. So 
How many people here use Outlook? Because I realize on main campus you use WAMs as well, and they don't often talk to each other. We don't use that'll be changing. Wams. That'll be changing. Yeah. Wams. Okay. Yeah. I hear that. I hear people are happy about that. So really, the goal is just to kind of um, be able to gather all of your artifacts very, very quickly, very, very easily using the things that you already use. Um, and so I'm just talking about just kind of. Um, not making anything harder for yourself, just smarter. Um, Office 365 is free to us. There's a web version and there's a desktop version. And those two versions can be slightly disorienting if you're using two different computers and if you're not sure which one you're using. So um, a little training using the Accelerate will help differentiate that. There are slight permutations that can drive you a little crazy. So I'm giving you a warning. When I go home, my computer looks like my, my system looks a little different. So you want to tease out which version that you're using, either the web base or the desktop base, and just stay consistent. Knowing that um, will reduce your anxiety. If you're using the web version, you have access everywhere, as long as you can remember your password and your user ID. Okay? So, Outlook has a lot of features, particularly the ones we're going to talk about or, or look at as the mail, your calendar, OneDrive, and tasks. So one click, one place, it's real easy to use, but mail, calendar, OneDrive, and task. We know what mail is, we know what calendar is. If you don't know what OneDrive is, it's your virtual cloud computing or cloud storage where you can uh, store all of your documents and work product. And of course, um, tasks, the things that we don't like to do. But we have to do them anyway. So email. Um, I'm a little OCD. I like to make sure I get through my email. I know, you know, I don't like a full email box. Um, I like things in its place. So part of this was a way of trying to organize my emails to make sure I responded to who I needed to respond to. I'm following up on information that I, I, I need to. And I can find it, right? I'm one of these people that used to have to, like, type in the keywords and hope that that one keyword will find the exact email. I'm not saying the system is foolproof, but I'm saying this is a system that gets you more organized. Some people probably already do this. If you have a better way of doing it, shout it out because we're here to really share. Um, some of the features in Outlook through mail, you, um, you're able to kind of create folders for all of your correspondence. And as a, a member of this union, you want to kind of co start collecting artifacts on service, your presentations, publications, I have a thank you file. So that's something to start thinking about how you organize your own emails so and when they come in, boom, you automatically put them in the folder. That's why I bring this to your attention in here. Mail, calendar, your contacts, and your to-do list all in one click that works on, you know, in one app through Outlook. Email. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, I organize my professional development folder. I'm also suffering through a doctoral program and hopefully I'll be done this year. Um, and so all of that is in this folder. Any presentations, uh, presentations that are accepted, emails. Again, archiving really helps so at the end of the week, I know where to put stuff. Maybe it sounds too simplistic, but believe me, if you don't have a system, the system will control you. Don't want that to happen. Public Publications, service, and a thank you note, a thank you folder. I think it's important that you create a thank you folder for yourself too because sometimes you forget why you're in this, why you're doing what you're doing, and every so often a student's going to drop something off, scan, put it in that file, or send you an email. Make sure you archive that. That does help. Um, so here's one opened up. The thank you also reminded me that I did a presentation, so sometimes you'll forget an email or you'll forget something that you did, and so that way you can cross-reference a lot of your information. All right? Example of, of how my folders look. Calendar. <clears throat> the other reason why you use the calendar is to, re to record and track all of the stuff that you've done over the past um, few years. You have the option to create down here multiple calendars as well. So while you have a work one, you can have a personal one that doesn't have to link to it, talk to each other. Um, you can create multiple ones if you teach courses as well as run programs. So again, a little bit more organization, a little bit more tweaking, it'll go a long way using <coughs> Office 365. What's very important though is when you do use a calendar, you create, create a legend for yourself. 
So when you start creating appointments or meetings or times for classes, you code um, and you categorize according to color so you can find exactly what you need for selective service or annual review. Makes it much easier that way. Um, this is just my organization quickly, again, according to my email file, publications, presentations, service, student appointments. I need to see, last, last week I needed to see how many students I saw that week or what percentage of my right, work product was just seeing students. When you code like this and when you make your appointments using this legend, it, make, it allows you to easily retrieve that information. And again, justify your work product and everything else that you do. To your, with your boss. Here's an example of uh, my week, whenever this was, with uh, different coding and um, colors to tease out what I was doing. This works for me, it may not work for you, but I recommend um, coming up with a system to easy, easy, more easily retrieve information you need. To do lists. I have scraps of paper in my office, several scraps of paper in my office back in envelopes with to-do lists. They're not very helpful when they're somewhere else in the bottom of my bag, right? <laughs> How many people do that? Okay. I'm getting to a point where I can't remember where I put it anymore either. I make multiple to-do lists of the same to-do list. This has helped me to slowly but surely be a lot more consistent and find it. Um, what I like about the to-do list is, again, you can archive information, again, proving to your boss that you actually do some work during the time that you see him or her, but even still, you can even get more deep into kind of who you're contacting, who you're working with, what are the additional costs and the hours that you do, okay? So again, same program, all at your same fingertips, don't have to go anywhere just processes that you make sure you just log in. And it's just curious, if another project comes up, you have this kind of archival history to say, well, you know, we need twice as many people as, as we did last time. It's going to take us this amount of time to do that. And, you know, of course, pay me just a little bit more if you don't mind. Okay. And last, OneDrive. People use Dropbox. Raise your hand if you use Dropbox. Okay. How many people use OneDrive? Okay, good. So people do know what this is. Um, it is a behavior to get, in, get into uh, archiving your work product and putting it in the cloud. It's just a behavior, but it does save a lot of headaches. Um, it helps you track what you're doing. And again, if you can see from my organization, I'm staying very consistent from my emails to my calendars to the folders on OneDrive. I have just a professional development folder. And once I go into that development folder, again, I'm staying very consistent with, with the presentations, professional record, publication, service, and travel. <coughs> so if something doesn't come in from, if something comes snail mail, I can scan and upload it. If something is delivered later, well, that's, yeah, that's the only really real reason to do that. Or something that's not an email attachment, I can, I have another archive for the information. Your name is Joseph? Yes. Okay, hi. You had a question? I want to know, does anybody know how much space we have in our OneDrive here at the University? I think a lot, I think people who've worked here all their life won't run out of space. They, they, a few years ago, um, we were having storage uh, uh, problems, and whatever IT did to double it or increase it has, um, has been uh, too, uh, sat satisfactory so that no one will have that problem. Good question. I, could, I just think you will be okay. You're welcome. Um, so again, having a system in place and then having behaviors that you upload information on a regular basis will save you a lot more headaches. Um, and this is just my quick and dirty system on how I use Word right at the fingertips, one app pretty much, to stay on top of things and to stay um, mostly saying during this process to put together my documentation. Any questions or concerns? Kim. Um, can you have the different folders in the email? Uh -huh. Can you copy an email so that it's in multiple folders? Yes. I think you can, because okay. I think there's a function of copying. <coughs> I think you can. Okay. 
And then with the coding that you were doing, mm -hmm. can you search? So can you actually search that particular code? So in your calendar, and you and you have all those check marks. Mm -hmm. When you select that particular category, what's going to populate is are all the activities in that category. So you can create a calendar just for um, meetings. You can see how many meetings you have. Can I do something where I see? Rather than having to scroll through a calendar, it's just a list of everything during a cer certain time period that met that category? I think you can. That's a good question. I don't do it that way, but I think there's a way to look at, um, there's a way of using tags, and I haven't played with Flow, which is another um, Office product. I've looked at it, but I haven't played with it. I think that's what Flow will let you do, is um, walk that way. Thank you. Good question. Any other question? Um, I'm in the School of Medicine. My email, if you'd like to reach out, is lrobinso. Don't know what happened to the end. lrobinso at wayne.edu. Thank you. Any other questions that we have for our other presenters? Feel free. This is the time. Yes. Um, Ryan, on your yeah. tips, um, do you have a, a maximum length? For the, like, the, the entire packet and everything? Yeah, here's the entire packet, not including something that will not including... Um, we didn't have anything about, about, about no, Nothing about So the question was, is there um, any uh, length uh, maximum we said? Uh, no, because I think it just depends on, on the person, how much they've done. That's why you have that for your summary, though, so that if you've done, you know, you've been here for 15, 20 years, then they can just focus on that for you. It's either highlighted or you have a separate, separate document just for those people. Is that uh, is that answer? Yeah. And the professional record is only supposed to be five years, right? right. No? Okay, yeah. so it's not going to be everything they've ever done. It's the last that. five years. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you do have that yeah. limitation, but yeah, we didn't come up with it. Any other questions? I want to first of all thank our presenters. Mm -hmm. Outstanding presentation. <laughs> and I also want to make you all aware of our next event, which is February 23rd, off the top of my head. I think that's right. It's Thursday, February 23rd, and we will be sending out invitations soon. Um, and that will be on ESS and promotion. So, and we're, we've been trying to time these right around when you are going to be expected to start working on this stuff in your relative, your respective units. Um, thank you again for coming. Look forward to seeing you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. I just wanted to quickly announce this Saturday the union is having a fun Saturday strategic session. That will be our third one in a year. And um, if anybody's interested in talking to me about it, it's 10 to 2 at the Scarab Club. So just if you're interested, come talk. I have a quick announcement too. Everybody remember tomorrow evening from 4 to 6, um, we're holding an academic forum. It's going to be in the 5057 DLA restaurant, which is in the lobby of our building, the Maccabees building at the corner of Woodward and um, Putnam Street. Uh, the Board of Governors will be there. It's a meet and greet. It's not just a program. They're actually there to mingle with all of you. We'll have some great hors d'oeuvres, some wine and beer. Feel free to join us. We'd love to see you. If there's anyone who wants to put the Blackboard site together, um, you're welcome to contact us, and we'd be happy to help as well.